Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a pleasure to see you all here this morning. We're going to try some things a little different today and hopefully they will work for us, uh, but bear with us while we get these things sorted out. Uh, this morning we have a few people who are, or this week we have a few people who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, our birthdays this week are Gary Hesse, Sarah Wenish, Caleb Wenish, Mariah Hoyt, David Nelson, Don Koopman, Regine Lwens, Kylie Wells, and Tabor Runk. Our anniversaries this week are Lynn and Nancy Anderson and Ivan and Darlene Anderson. Uh, if you see, well, you probably won't see any of these folks around town this week, but feel free to give them a call or send them a message or something to let them know you're thinking about them uh, this week as they celebrate their birthdays and anniversaries. We begin our um, service this morning with the processional gospel for Palm Sunday, which is found in John chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through 19. Uh, and this is a point where if you have fashioned palm branches or have some kind of green branch in your home, uh, I invite you to uh, get out your palm branches. We will be singing all glory, laud, and honor following this uh, gospel reading. We gather as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Here ends the reading. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was acclaimed son of David and king of kings by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms. Grant that we may ever hail him as our Lord and king and follow him with perfect confidence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join in singing verses, uh, two verses of the hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. <laughs> Thank you. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. O God, our King and our Lord, like the crowds that surrounded the Christ on that first Palm Sunday, we often praise you with our lips only to reject you in our hearts. Take disloyalty and unfaithfulness out of our lives and hear us now as we pray together asking for our forgiveness. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, help me to search within myself to discover where I stand in the crowd. Am I among those who would deny you because you want me to do things in a way that is different? Do I really want you to be my king when you lead me to give and serve rather than take? Forgive me when I do not make the necessary effort to follow your teachings. Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. By the authority Christ has given to all the baptized, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from Philippians chapter 2. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the reading. Psalm 118, starting with chapter 19. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day, the Lord has acted, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We will bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has shined upon us. From a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar, you are my God and I will thank you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. I'll begin the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 26. And just to let everybody know, I have my palm branches ready. I have my bread ready for communion, so everybody can get that ready. The gospel reading, starting Matthew chapter 26. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, the time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed 
directed them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after the other, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would be better for that one had he not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will, you will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But, at, but after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to, to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. 
At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that, that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring him about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. 
When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. He went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom the price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price. And they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The Governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. And he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him 
and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he could not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there, was, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he's been raised from the dead and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. Gospel of the Lord. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The highs and lows of this day are almost too much to bear. We begin the morning with Jesus riding into the holy city, welcomed as a hero. 
Normally, our Sunday school kids would have marched around singing and waving their palm branches in honor of that joyous day. But now, just a few minutes later, here we are, and Jesus has been executed at the local dump. The joy and celebration of Palm Sunday is so quickly overshadowed by the darkness of the Sunday of the Passion. Life very quickly gives way to death. Light gives way to darkness. And nothing is darker than this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The rest of it is understandable, almost predictable even. The adoring crowd is quickly turned against their would-be king. Some well-placed operatives know that a crowd that's willing to stand in the streets shouting Hosanna can also probably be nudged into shouting crucify him if they're given the right prodding. Judas sees an opportunity for a quick buck, maybe to make a name for himself among the religious leaders. Maybe out of some kind of disappointment in how Jesus is conducting his business. Or maybe just because he's a lost sinner like the rest of us. But he sees the opportunity and he takes it, trading Jesus, his friend, his teacher, for 30 pieces of silver. The rest of the disciples make their usual declarations about standing firm, only to flee when things take a dangerous turn in Gethsemane. They didn't get any silver coins out of the deal, but they're hardly in a position to look down their noses at Judas. Peter has three opportunities to declare his loyalty to Jesus, but the stakes are too high, the danger too real. So he just keeps warming his hands by the fire, pretending to be a casual observer to this spectacle of a trial. And the religious and political leaders do what people in power so often and so easily do. They sought to protect their own interests, hang on to their own power. They can't have this Jesus turning people against them. So they gin up a bogus charge and conduct a sham trial. And the man who could stop it all, Pilate, the Roman governor, declares that it's not his problem. He washes his hands of it. He wants, his no he wants nothing to do with it because he's got bigger things to worry about, like how to get promoted to somewhere better than Jerusalem. If we'd been paying attention to what was happening up to this point in the life of Jesus, none of what happened that night and into the morning would be very surprising. Sinners did what sinners do. A world in rebellion against our God takes that rebellion to its logical conclusion, putting him to death when he dares to show up here in the flesh. And what better way to complete a rebellion than to put your ruler to death? There's kind of a perverse logic to this whole thing, kind of inevitability. But that logic comes to an abrupt end in this cry of Jesus from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What are we supposed to make of that? Where does that leave us if we assume Jesus was just carrying out a preordained plan? Why would he say that? Had something gone wrong with the plan? Is this not what the Lord had in mind all along? We use the term God forsaken pretty lightly in our world. It describes places we'd rather not go, landscapes that are barren or unappealing, places that are backwards in some way. But there's nothing light about this cry of Jesus. It is all darkness. It is all agony. It's all abandonment. As he hung there on the cross, Jesus was quite completely alone. There was no rescue from the clouds. There, were, there was no army of angels not even a handful of zealous followers. There was no one attempting to stop this travesty. Anyone with eyes to, to see could see that Jesus had been forsaken by everyone. 
And in keeping with the general theme of having no idea what Jesus was doing or saying, the crowd misunderstands this cry. They think he's calling for Elijah. And they start to look around just in case they've made a mistake. And Elijah actually is coming for him. They've seen enough of Jesus' power to be a little worried that maybe they've gotten this wrong, but not worried enough to stop it. It crosses their minds that Jesus could be the Messiah after all, but why let that stop a good show? But Elijah didn't show up either, so they were safe. No one showed up to rescue Jesus from his entirely unjust, undeserved murder. We sometimes imagine that we know something of what Jesus must have been thinking when we experience suffering. When life smacks us down with events that are unfair, that break our spirits, we find ourselves muttering something like this. Maybe we're overtly, overtly religious about it, wondering where God is in our suffering. Or maybe we just wonder more abstractly, why me? What have I done to deserve this? As we see this disease ripping through our world, disrupting lives, taking lives, we might wonder, where is God? Why has he forsaken us? It's a common enough question, but there's a key difference between us and Jesus. Because we haven't been going around doing God's will. We've been going around sinning. We've been going around living as if we have no need of God, as if we are gods unto ourselves. We've been going around opposed to God's will at our very core. But Jesus went around healing the sick. He went around feeding the hungry. He went around raising the dead. He went around forgiving sins. He went around being God in the flesh in this world and still he hangs there forsaken. There's no answer to his cry. There's no explanation. He dies there on that cross for real. The light is put out and the world sits in darkness. And if that were the end of the story, it would be nothing but a tragedy. It would be nothing but one more injustice in a world filled with injustice, one more sin in a world held tightly in the grip of sin, one more triumph of darkness over light. But even on this day, filled with so much darkness, we know that this is not the end of the story. This moment of God's absence has given way to God's presence in a way we couldn't begin to imagine. This moment of total darkness has given way to a light that will never be put out. In just a moment, we will celebrate that light and presence in our Lord's Supper. We will receive the body and blood of this one who defeated death by going through it. You will receive his forgiveness for all the ways you have forsaken him. It's not the usual way you receive this gift. It may even seem strange and not quite right. But our forsaken and resurrected Lord has promised that where his word and the bread and wine are brought together, he will be there for you. This one who broke the chains of death can surely break the chains of your current isolation. And for those who choose to wait until we're all together again in the flesh, his word and his forgiveness are for you just the same. This one so easily forsaken by the world, this one left so totally alone, will never forsake you. Will never leave you alone, even if you feel alone, even if you feel forsaken at the moment. This forsaken one, the Father, has redeemed by raising him from the dead. And because he has been redeemed, you are too. And because he has been raised from the dead, so will you be. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Now let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that despite our sin, you have not forsaken us. Send your Holy Spirit upon us so that even in the midst of suffering and sorrow, we might be confidence of your un confident of your unfailing presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as your world sits in darkness, we pray that you would send your light among us and that you would make us your light in the world. inspire our witness that even in times of trial, we might be able to account for the hope that is in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, we pray for your people throughout the world. We pray especially for our friends in India, Mexico, and we pray that you would keep our nation in your care. Strengthen the doctors and nurses who are caring for the sick all over the world, and comfort all your people with the holy and certain hope that the lives of your beloved children are always in your hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This time I invite those of you who are uh, home with your families to please join in uh, in the words of institution in your own homes, you can feel free to uh, turn off the sound on the computer for a moment or on your phone. Uh, and I would ask that one member of the family uh, read the words of institution and serve communion to the rest of your family. If you are home alone, uh, I invite you to join with me in reading the words of institution. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.